This and each and every episode of the Hook It podcast is supported by 35 Bikes. 35 Bikes are dedicated to bringing you the best bike components for the best price. So whether you need organic or sintered brake pads, brake rotors, narrow wide chain rings, mud guards or even custom mud guards for your brand, shop or organisation, make sure to ask for 35 Bikes in your local bike shop or head to 35bikes.com for more information and to find your local stockist. Donny Hart here, and you're listening to the Hook It Podcast. What's going on, podcast people? Welcome back to another episode of the Hook It podcast. As you've probably noticed, this is episode 25, our silver anniversary episode. Um, And the day this is released, it's actually also our one-year anniversary. So I just want to say a really, really quick thank you to everyone for the last year's worth of support. For everyone who's been a guest, everyone who's shared, liked, left reviews, um, it's been an amazing year. It's been insane to sort of sit and uh, obviously there's been quite a lot of work going into this, but just watch this podcast grow. Um, seen some new podcasts come up in that time as well, uh, which are all really good as well. So yeah, it's cool. Just want to say a really quick thank you anyway for everyone um, for the past year's support. Give yourself the pat on the back. Bosh. Um, so this episode, we've got Claudio Calori. Um, Claudio, I guess, doesn't really need much of an introduction. He's the guy who does all the POV runs before the World Cup downhill. Uh, obviously, in this episode, we chat a little bit about that. We also chat about Velo Solutions, his pump track company, um, his Pump for Peace project, which is really interesting. He's got some awesome things lined up with that. Um, and obviously, a little bit of chat about the upcoming downhill series, which um, is about, I guess, when this episode's released, it'll be five days away. So, plenty of build-up in this episode for that too. So, once again, thank you everyone. If you do enjoy this episode, please tell your friends, give us a like and a share, um, and if you can, leave a review on iTunes. It means an absolute bunch. Um, right, without further ado, let's welcome to the show, Claudio Kiluri. All right, dude, we are recording. Welcome to the Hook It podcast. Um, Thank you. Yeah. I might have my kids popping in once in a while and have to tell them shut up, but That's all right. it's all good. Yeah, we don't <laughs> mind a few guest appearances, a few cameos. <laughs> it's no problem, man. It's no problem. But uh, it's actually, I just noticed it's episode 25. It's like a some sort of milestone. Oh, wow. like anniversary. A, yeah, it's, a, it's an anniversary and it's almost one year since we started this thing too. So uh, Okay, cool. You're almost a, a guest of honor, I think. <laughs> um okay so the first thing that we always kind of like to do is let you give yourself a brief introduction if that's okay um i don't want to do you any disservice there's a lot of strings to your bow and i don't want to miss stuff so if you want to do like a real quick who you are what you do that'd be amazing well i might even miss stuff myself (laughs) (laughs) um so yeah where should I start? My name is Claudia Kaluri, born in Switzerland in 77. So yes, I am. No, I'm not that old. I'm 25. <laughs> um, uh, started playing hockey as a kid. Then my parents bought me a mountain bike to be able to train for hockey. But then uh, mountain biking became more fun than playing hockey. So I swapped and did four years of cross country first, then swapped to downhill. And after my active career, I opened up my own racing team, which was back then the Tomac racing team, the Tomac factory team. And one year later, we switched to Scott and have been, that was in 2008. So we stayed with Scott ever since. And during my active career, we founded Velo Solutions. Um, that was sitting quite still until I quit racing and, and then it started going off. Okay, perfect. Um, you mentioned uh, 
obviously I like to sort of rewind things a little bit and sort of start at the beginning. So you were playing hockey as a youth, obviously living in Switzerland, hockey's going to be pretty big over there. Um, I was going to ask you about that later on, actually, because obviously you do all the uh, POV stuff for the crashed ice too. Um, yeah, yeah. And I used to play hockey uh, up until about two years ago. And I was like, I saw you skate. And obviously when you skate, you know how and how do you how do you how do you word it like you know if someone can really skate or not and i watched you i was like shit yeah you must be an ex-hockey player or something because you're really good <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah is hockey big in in switzerland or no yeah it's huge yeah. it's just behind soccer i would say really um well it's one of the best leagues in in europe right um and so when i was playing as a kid for nine years that was pretty serious business. So we went to hockey training at five in the morning before school starts and stuff like that. Wow. Gnarly. Yeah, I'm a, yeah. Big, I'm a big hockey fan. The playoffs are just starting too, so I'm so yeah, starting to tune in a little bit more to it myself. Um, okay, so then you mentioned you, you got into mountain biking. I guess you, your family or your parents bought you a mountain bike. Um, did you initially like start racing straight away or did it take a bit of time for that to sort of start happening? No, actually, they bought me a mountain bike because they asked me um, if it would be okay buying me a mountain bike if then I would ride the bike to hockey training every day rather than they driving me every day. So I was like, yeah, cool, I get a mountain bike. But then, uh, yeah, it it just uh, it was so so much fun that I spent more more time on the bike than on the ice, and at some point I. I switched to racing. I guess I wasn't the best team player as a kid either. Didn't really get along with the, <laughs> with the team. So uh, doing a single sport was was the better choice for me right, back okay, then. Okay, that's a. I started playing literally um, just to get away from. I mean, I've been involved in sort of like the the mountain bike and motocross industry for like ten or twelve years, I guess now. And I re- originally started playing hockey just because it was easier. T- to do that and to just get away from everything. Like I'd go play hockey and none of the teammates knew what I did for a living. They didn't know if I rode bikes or anything. And I loved it. It's like nice just to have like a release sometimes just to go do something totally different. Um, and obviously be able to check people and all that sort of stuff. It's pretty fun. <laughs> get, get yeah. Some, get just some aggression go out, out. <laughs> wild and hard. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, obviously. Okay. So you've obviously got a mountain bike. Uh, started riding, started racing. When did that lead to the to the sort of like the World Cups and stuff? Well, at first I raced four years of cross country as a junior and uh, first year amateur. But then, uh, you know, I got in contact with a bit of the punk rock scene and the alternative <laughs> scene, and and that all took me towards towards gravity. Yeah. And also during one training. I was riding next to a BMX track and I had never seen a a BMX track in my life before. Right. And that was when I was 19, believe it or not. <laughs> um, so I took a couple of laps on it. It was so much fun that a couple of weeks later I bought a BMX. And, and that was it for my cross-country career because the following winter I didn't spend on a road bike. I just spent it on that on that BMX track and the following cross country season, I would smoke everybody on the downhills, <laughs> but they would smoke me back on, on the uphills. Right. And so, <laughs> yeah, it was kind of a natural, a natural move. It wasn't really a decision or anything. Okay. Um, well it was, I guess it was a tough decision actually, but, but a, a clear one anyway. At yeah. The end. yeah. 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 Um, and obviously then you, you must've, found downhill in some respects like is that because of of sort of seeing gravity stuff is that what you mean like you saw that and thought fuck i want to have a go at that stuff yeah obviously all the people that i met training on on the bmx track um have become really good friends and they were in in the in the downhill scene so i went downhill racing with them and at first i thought i could do both yeah back in the day some (laughs) people tried that still but (laughs) then i was pretty uh, much realized that it's that it's one or the other and that was quite clear that it was going to be downhill yeah for sure for sure i watched a video the other day with a i think it's called happy in a skin suit on youtube (laughs) (laughs) it's so good (laughs) i'm not entirely sure what year that was i'm gonna guess it's like 
2002. Oh, really? 2002. 2002. Wow. Yeah. That was a good video. I'll, uh, I'll post that to people on here if, if, if you've not seen it. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> um, what, um, just out of interest, what was your best World Cup result? Because I tried looking and I just couldn't find it, if I'm honest. <laughs> that was that one there on the video Sweet. of Happy in a Skin Suit. <laughs> okay. I, happy, I came in fourth. I, I had many like really good qualifiers, top 10 qualifiers for a long time, but I would never make it down in the finals when it really counted. Mm. And so I qualified sixth on that day. And when I came down, I was first. So I knew this time I had it. And uh, that's why I re reacted that way. <laughs> Such a good video. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> Excellent, excellent. Uh, okay, so that's cool. So we kind of figured out a bit of your backstory and stuff. That's awesome. Um, so how long did you have your downhill career for? How long were you actually on the circuit? Well, I started racing in 93, but I said that was cross country. Then I did my first tries in in downhill, but with the cross country bike in, in 96, and then really started racing downhill in 97. Um, and I still raced when I had the Tomac team in 2008, right. um, but that was my last season then. Okay. Got and you. then from 2009 on, I was just, uh, just a team manager. Just a team manager. Okay. Okay. Right. Sweet. Well, before I, I want to talk to you obviously about team management and stuff, um, but I'm also super interested in v Velo Solutions. So... How did you begin to start Velo Solutions? Was this while you were racing, or is it something that you literally started after you'd you'd finished riding? Well, you know, like many other racers, um, we all build our tracks, and uh, so it actually started in '99 when I was uh, training in San Diego over the winter, mm. together with uh, Sean Heimdahl, who then after that became uh, a team owner as well. Right. actually for the iron horse team and he was the one that brought up um sam hill okay so uh i was staying with him training with him um so we built that that trail in san diego and that trail actually became a spot where many other pro riders went to in the winter to train on and even some some World Cup teams did their full camps there. So right. I, I thought, well, maybe I did something right there. And, <laughs> it, you know, it just went on like that. But then in 2004, two friends of mine and me, we founded Velo Solutions um, and did a couple of projects. But since they had to do them alone without me because I was still racing the World Cup, they... Um, they quit and they said, well, we don't want to do it without you. So they found other jobs. And by the time I quit racing and would have been ready for them, they were all settled with their jobs. So I was alone with Velo Solutions. I'm still trying to get them back. But, really? <laughs> um, but um, yeah, so that's why I, I reopened Velo Solutions after my, my racing career and then uh, – the whole palm track story went off. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so in San Diego too, is that like the era when, when Petey moved out there as well? And I guess uh, there'll be Eric Carter was around there. Was Palmer living around the area too at the same time? Yeah, we, we were like Mike King, Brian yeah. Lopes, Eric Carter. We were all riding together. Obviously, they were already World Cup stars when I, when I came into the scene. So... Was a bit of a different level so for me it was like riding with my idols yeah but uh it was really cool time yeah yeah i bet you had some fun that's for sure <laughs> <laughs> all right so uh velo solutions obviously that gets going and like how many people do you have involved in velo solutions right now because obviously i've been looking into it a little bit more of it before you came on here um and some of the projects you've done are insane obviously it the doc well documented on like social media and like on all websites and you know all that sort of stuff but how many people are actually involved in this thing and how on earth do you make some of these things happen <laughs> <laughs> well in switzerland we have 15 people wow but then we have crews in germany austria italy uk uh latvia 
the Netherlands, Canada, USA, Brazil. I hope I didn't forget anybody. Yeah, South Africa. Yeah, South Africa is going big. And then we have partners in New Zealand and Australia too, but we're still waiting for the first project there. Wow, dude, that's epic. Epic. And <laughs> <laughs> that's insane. I didn't expect you to say that many countries and stuff. So, wow. Um, so you've got all these people, are they like pretty much full time or do they just come in when you've got a, a job on sort of thing? Well, the ones in Switzerland are yeah. by now pretty much full time. Yeah. Then in the other countries, the, the pump track market has has to develop still um, because, you know, in Switzerland, it's going so crazy that uh, pretty much every every town wants a pump track now. Um, in other countries, that still has to come. Yeah. But uh, yeah. we're getting there. <laughs> so good, dude. That's amazing. So how many do you have in, in Switzerland? Do you know? Like pump tracks you've built? No, actually, that is a task I need to to do. <laughs> like count really how many we've built already. Wow! Do a road trip, go visit them all. <laughs> <laughs> Has there been like a a best project so far? I'm guessing, looking at it from my side, the one in New York City is going to be pretty close. Um, that thing looked amazing. Is, is there one which really stands out for you, which you really want to to land and, and get done? Well, yeah, as you said, uh, the one in New York City was something just unbelievable, you know, like for real, when I sat in the in the excavator at once a day or a couple of times a day, I had to turn off the machine and, and just make sure I'm not dreaming because I'm actually sitting in a digger looking at the uh, Statue of Liberty and at the uh, Empire State Building at the same time. Um from my pump track so it was just absolutely unreal um yeah that that was an experience that i will always remember but then you know projects in india in thailand in bali those are in a different way but they're just as as cool you know yeah yeah man that must be a huge reality check when you sat there in new york city just like what? yeah <laughs> what the hell <laughs> that's insane good work good work and uh pump for peace i've been seeing this thing pop up quite a lot on instagram um i'm just personally pretty keen to know a little bit more about that i, I saw one of one of the mission statements you guys kind of put out about trying to provide a, a pump track in every city um is that part of the pump for peace stuff or is it something totally different uh pump for peace is an idea i had with some friends from the uk actually okay um that uh, we want to bring a pump track or several pump tracks to to places that wouldn't be able to afford them, mm. like let's say underprivileged areas. And uh, at first we thought, uh, yeah, it's just going to be a one-off where we where we get all together, take some riders like Brendan and and his friends, and go to some some sketchy place like uh, Afghanistan and then build a pump track there for the for the kids that just got out of war. Yeah. Um, and I did some research. I was in contact with some guys in Kabul, um, but they really, they said you can absolutely not c come in here because it's, it's really too dangerous. You're going to be kidnapped. That's almost for sure. Right. So, so we were in contact with other with other uh, organizations um, that, that they are in South Africa and in in uh, Cambodia. Right. Um, but it, it didn't really go any further. So then at the beginning of this year, a friend from Germany called me about um, about the video project he wants to do in Lesotho. Mm -hmm. which is a little country in South Africa that is really, really remote. It, it, it has lots of, lots of, or big part, big, sorry, my English is going down the drain right now. <laughs> it's all right, man, uh, it's all good. Big parts of the country have actually no roads. Right. So the, all the villages are connected just with horse trails. So the idea of my friend was that we would ride behind horses with our bikes on those horse trails from town to town explore the country and shoot it um 
and make a documentary about it. And he wanted me to be part of this story. And I said, listen, I'll, I'll be in India and in Chile and wherever in the world building pump tracks. I cannot do it, but uh, I can get to writers. Yeah. If, and so we had uh, Andrew Neithling planned and, and Kevin Landry from Canada, but then Andrew Neithling couldn't do it. So my friend called me again and said, hey, uh, you really have to help me out here and you got to do it. So uh, I said, okay, well, is there, a, is there a possibility to start the whole Pump for Peace project there? Do they need a pump track? W would a pump track in this country actually make sense? Um, because, you know, if the kids are too poor and they don't even have bikes and they need food first, yeah. then it, it, it doesn't make sense to go give them a pump track. Yeah. But it, it turns out that the place we're staying at or the starting point of the whole expedition there is a mountain bike place and they're desperately waiting for a pump track <laughs> and they have a community center next to it with lots of orphans and uh, they don't have anything to do. So it turns out it is just the place to start the project. And that's where I said, okay, if, if we can start the pump for peace project there, it, um, then I'll do the video yeah. project with you. And so that, you know, it was very fast and not extremely well prepared, but I just thought we can we can talk all life long about doing something good, mm -hmm. but at some point you just have to do it. And this is the place where we're going to start it. Um, but then there's more to it, to the whole pump for peace idea, because obviously if we just went to places and built pump tracks for free on our own cost, then it is kind of limited on how many we can do yeah. per year because yeah. uh, obviously our resources are not endless um, so we had the idea of combining our passion for pump tracks with our our passion for music huh. and uh, so one of my friends is a is a music agent in South Africa I told her about the idea and she loved the idea and started running around the world and contacting bands and stuff. So um, the idea is that we find interested bands. And, and, you know, many of them, of the big rock groups are also mountain bikers. So they might be into it. Yeah. yeah, if, yeah. If, if they give us a good, a good deal on a concert from them, so that we can actually make money with their concert or raise money with their concert to then use that money and build more pump tracks in those underprivileged areas in the world. Um, that way we can make the Pump for Peace project a sustainable model that is not just once in two years or once in five years, but maybe we can actually build many pump tracks for many townships in South Africa or in Nepal or in wherever it might be in the whole world. And uh, so this is something we kicked off last week in, in Lesotho. It looks, yeah, like I said, I've been following the pro project on, on Instagram and it's amazing, man, what you're doing. It's, it's insane. Uh, and I, man, I don't know. I want to try and help as much as possible. <laughs> so if people are listening to this, you can hook Claudio up with uh, bands or whoever. Just, yeah, let's try and get, get you guys linked up. Um, yeah. Sometimes the power of the podcast is pretty incredible. So let's uh, hopefully something comes back. But there's um, I can't remember the guy's name from Rage Against the Machine. He's a isn't he a really big mountain? Yeah, biker? he's a mountain biker. Yeah. yeah, and I I was actually thinking of trying to contact him, but I also hope that uh, Dave Grohl and Eddie Feder are listening to your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Dave Grohl, if you're listening, <laughs> reach out. <laughs> You never know, man. You never know. Um, but yeah, I think like uh, Berriclough and stuff know know him pretty well, I think. I might be wrong. I'm sure I saw videos of them together and stuff. So maybe you can link that up. That'd be cool to do a Rage concert or something, something similar, or Prophets of Rage or something like that. Um, yeah, yeah. Wow. It's insane, Dan. It's insane. So has there already been plenty more interest as well? Have you had other bands already start coming back to you and want to get involved with the project? Well, believe it or not, we did have uh, we did have 
I had the contract almost ready with, with beep. Yeah, we decided to leave the name of the band out of this episode just in case there are any more contract issues in the future and obviously to prevent any more contract problems. Carry on. It fell through for some weird reason. Holy shit. <laughs> but I will try it. I will try my best again to to get them on it and uh yeah. Well, yes, That's that would be that would be a, a major goal. It would. It would be massive. Wow. Fair play, man. That's really good. And does it feel good from your side of things as well, like knowing that you're doing something for the for the good of humanity and not just Do you know what I mean? Like you're not just doing pump tracks for the sake of building pump tracks, which you probably don't look at it like that, but you really are doing something to help the world, which is pretty hard to do so is that how you're looking at it yeah yeah for sure you yeah. know like uh working working as much as i do cannot be for money only you know mm-hmm. money would not be enough satisfaction to work to work that much yeah. um but if you get the feeling that you're actually do something that people appreciate and that people love and and uh, um not only people do, I do too. Yeah, you're proud of <laughs> so, it too, right? Uh, yeah, and uh, that just gives you energy to work even harder. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Awesome, dude. Awesome. Well, I'm going to continue following the progress, uh, the project. And uh, I think the launch is, is it tomorrow? You, you've got a concert and stuff um, in, how do you say it, Les- Lesotho? Lesotho. 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 I, I didn't know you would you would call it Lesotho either, but because it's <laughs> it's written with O's. Yeah. But anyway, no, the concert was last Saturday already, so oh, really? uh, okay. okay, it's launched. We just didn't publish any footage yet because we want to. As said, it it was a really really rushed mm. situation, so we just went there and built it. Um, and now we need to get the whole thing, the website up and the video ready and, and everything, and then we'll launch it. Awesome, man. Awesome. Awesome story. Really, really cool. Really cool. Um, okay, that's mad. Um, so let's move on to some team manager stuff, because obviously we had uh, Kathy Sessler on the last episode, which was really interesting hearing about her views of being a team manager. You said you started off with Tomac Bikes. Um, yeah, which is pretty cool in itself. Obviously, I'm a huge Moto fan, which I don't want to get into because people sometimes take the piss because I talk about Moto so much. <laughs> but obviously, <laughs> Eli's been having a good season and it's getting pretty exciting towards the end of the Supercross. But um, yeah, we'll not get into that. <laughs> people will be screaming in the in the listening to this to be like, "Don't talk about motocross again, please. Just leave it." <laughs> um, so you started working with Scott. Um, I noticed recently it's now the Scott Velo Solutions team. So have you sort of, has your role changed at all or is it the same but you're now a sponsor of the, of the team? Does that make sense? Um, I don't think it has changed much except for, yes, we are we are a title sponsor of the team, which um, I would say we're quite proud of too, even though, to be honest, it wasn't quite planned that way yeah. um start pulled out which we knew and uh we couldn't find the replacement for them so it was either giving up the team and finish it after the nine years we've built it up or take the step and become title sponsor of my own team mm-hmm. which uh, was not along this it was not it, it didn't it's take easy. a lot a long <laughs> time to think about it yes no no. um do you think that your role is going to change much or is there any more added pressure to running a team i'm guessing it's pretty tough anyway or and a lot of work but has you got more work because of it well for me it probably got (laughs) i just have to make sure my company runs well now so we can afford the team okay so uh yes i have to be really focused on velo solutions but um i do have really good people now that take care of the team so i don't have to do everything on my own you know i have cyril as the sports director cyril lanio who was also a pro racer before and i was actually racing on the same team with him together when uh when the happy in a skin suit mo- movie happened <laughs> <laughs> Out of all and, of the uh, YouTube videos you're on, that's probably my one of my favorites. I think. 
Brilliant. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. Okay, so you've got obviously more people underneath you as well and, and, and get, sort, sort of can do some of the tasks for you and stuff like that. Take the weight yeah, off the shoulders a little to, bit. to run the team all by myself, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, a new rider as well this year um, whose name I really can't pronounce is it Gaëtan Vigé yeah I wouldn't have said that at all like you, you <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't have sounded anything like that <laughs> okay so one new rider and obviously you're keeping Brendan um, what is it like managing Brendan Fairclough is it pretty scary at times because of all the free ride stuff or am I really supposed to say something about that here <laughs> I can imagine it's pretty scary. <laughs> no, you know, Brendan is a free spirit, and the more you let him do his own thing, yeah. the better he performs. The more I try to push him in a th- certain direction, the less he will perform. So we've learned to just let him do his thing, yeah. and uh, that's how he works, and that's why he his name is the Free Racer, right? Yep, man, Free Racer. It's uh, I don't know. I, I wouldn't like to be in your shoes sometimes, especially maybe at Rampage. I'm I'm kind of wondering: Do you go to Rampage just to keep an eye on him, or <laughs> or do you need to be there? <laughs> well, you know, last last year when he did that huge gap up there, I oh, was man. actually properly scared. And when he did um, slightly injure his finger or his hand just enough to not be able to. Ah, to yeah. compete yeah. Um, really in bad. some way obviously it sucked because he, he would have loved to do it and he would have done well with this crazy line he had up there mm. but in some way I was also relieved that he didn't have to attempt that crazy gap again you know like um, he crashed on it but he didn't seriously get injured um, but he got injured just enough to not be able to to do that weekend and so in some way even though that might be wrong to say but but i was kind of relieved yeah. that uh, yeah <laughs> he can... obviously i would would have loved it if he did well again and i hope he's going to be invited again mm-hmm. but uh, yeah it's a little breath of uh, a little sigh of relief for you knowing that the team rider is going to make it down the bottom of the hill and safely. <laughs> yeah. Excellent, excellent. Um, what, um, what do you think it takes to be a really good team manager these days? Well, if I knew it, I would be a good team manager. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure you're a good team manager, dude. <laughs> it was funny because I asked, I asked uh, Kathy the same thing, and wow, she was just like, well, you need to be able to cook clean <laughs> look after them <laughs> um, i'm guessing you don't do much of that stuff but um is it just a case of literally just been there for the guys all weekend been able to take the stress off them so they can just do their job um and get down the hill as fast as possible is that pretty much how you look at it well you know I, i've been in the past i've been thinking about it a lot like you know some some team managers put a lot of pressure on their riders and I do really not, even though it seems like it when I come into races, I almost, I'm always a bit um, sarcastic about Brendan when, we, when we're commenting, commenting so. with, with Rob. Yeah. Um, but in reality, as I said, we let, we let Brendan do his thing. Mm-hmm. And some, I know that in other teams, uh, everything is a lot more strict and a lot more structured and um, I feel that a writer has to want it himself. Yeah. He, the, he, the writer has to want to win. And uh, if that will only comes from my side, it won't help at all. Mm. Um, but then on other teams, it works completely different. Uh, they clearly put the pressure on the writers and they perform. So I don't know if my way is the right way. I'm just not not good in putting pressure on people yeah that makes sense so the vibe for the team is is just pretty laid laid back sort of yeah nothing too stressful just uh go there have fun and and hopefully get good results pretty much no you know obviously we we want to do things right and we want the results and we want to represent our sponsors 
as good as we can. Um, and up until the race, we are focused on the race. And then as soon as the race is over, we go rock and roll. But uh, it, it's not that we're going to a World Cup just to play around. Obviously, we, we want to perform. Yeah. Um, but there's just uh, different ways on how to, how to try to push a rider to his maximum performance. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah, you can easily probably motivate but um but bring him down at the same time if you're pushing too hard for it um again that's something kathy was talking about with josh you know josh pretty much had had enough of racing during the season and you, you can't make him at the end of the day you know you just gotta let him or, or the said rider just do what they want to do you know um yeah and then to... every rider's different again you know like yeah. some riders really need the guidance and and some riders need the pressure mm. and then brandon is is a guy who certainly doesn't you really just have to let him do it and and then he will surprise you with sudden performance <laughs> yeah for sure i think uh i think he's got a win in him this year dude i think brendan's got a win in him uh, <laughs> it's gonna happen this year i think <laughs> well it has to <laughs> been so close so well, many times now i would take it yeah um, i'm sure i would say no <laughs> <laughs> okay cool man um I wanted to talk to you as well about um, about obviously the POV stuff and also your commentating. Um, how did you get into commentating? Well, that was pretty much just Red Bull asking me. I never right. applied for it or anything. They they did a test round with me when when Connie was out in Windham three years ago. He was at another event. I think it was an EWS. Yeah. And uh, so they needed to replace him. So they asked me if I wanted to do a tryout. And apparently they liked it, even though I did not even recognize my own rider out of the gate. Really? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was some dude that looked exactly like Brendan. And I said, oh, there's Brendan in the start. And Rob looks at me all confused. And he couldn't <laughs> believe that I didn't even recognize my own, my own rider. <laughs> <laughs> is it a tough job then or like i don't know i can't even imagine doing it i can i can see it being really difficult um do you just sort of go with it is there a lot of research which goes into the back end of it as well with with rob or um do you just sort of vibe off each other how does it how does it go down well you know for rob it is certainly a really really tough job he right. prepares he prepares really really hard for it he for him it's a full week of full-on work and focus and making sure that the whole show runs through yeah uh for me i can pretty much just react on on what's happening for me it's a lot less preparation there is a little bit but not too much mm. um so i just have to check what's happening at the race and and then react to it yeah it can be tough sometimes there's so much i'm um, obviously with you as well you've got so many projects on the go all the time remembering I, I don't know who won the last round all that sort of stuff can probably easily get i don't know di what's the word easily fall away and not be so uh at the front of your brain i'm guessing there's a lot of other things yeah, floating around yeah, in there too sure. um yeah I'd, I'd really struggle my downhill knowledge is pretty bad sometimes even though i've probably watched every race for the last i don't know six or seven eight years like i'm yeah. still terrible but my friend joe from steel city media you can ask him anything from any race anytime and he, he just knows it it's weird <laughs> okay uh, it's crazy I don't... maybe he should become the expert maybe <laughs> nah we'll just leave you and rob to it man it's funny <laughs> um so how did the so sorry the uh the pov runs obviously they're hilarious you've got massive youtube hits i was looking yesterday and some of them have got like over millions of downloads which is nuts but are they like really totally dry um I remember the first one from Lords last year. You were saying as you sort of left the start gate that that was your first run on a downhill bike in like all year almost. <laughs> the first time on that bike. Is it really that dry? Well, fact is we're going to Lourdes next week. Yep. And I haven't ridden my downhill bike since Rampage. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, I'll do a commentary lesson on Monday in London. So I get up to speed together with Rob. Yep. 
and then I will fly to Lourdes on Tuesday, which gives me Wednesday to try to get a couple of runs in on my downhill bike before we then do um, the oh. GoPro run on, on Thursday. Okay. Um, but those runs on Wednesday won't be on the on the World Cup track because it is a fact that the the GoPro run is my first actual run on my first and only run on the World Cup track. Okay, sweet. That's impressive. Fair play, man. <laughs> Imagine it's pretty scary. <laughs> um, do you know who you who you're going to be chasing as well in the first one or not? No, I actually don't. I should probably call Red Bull and see what they have in mind or uh, if I should come up with my with my own idea. Yeah, if you want me to come out and do it, man, we'll have a really slow run down. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe stop for a beer halfway too, you know. <laughs> well, you know, I was thinking if we ride slow, yeah. we just have to talk really slow too and then we can speed it speed up. Speed it up, yeah, exactly. Just be like, we're going to do a really detailed look at the track. Like every rock, we're just going to go real slow. We're going to keep on the brakes. Yeah, give people a really good look at the track. Every route, every everything. I think that's the way yeah. to attack it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sweet. So obviously the downhill season starts, well, when we release this, it'll be next weekend. Um. Any predictions from you so far? I'm sure people ask you this all the time, but it's going to be pretty interesting to hear what you, what you think. Well, I can't tell you the test results from the Fox suspension tests a couple of weeks ago. Okay. I know the times, and they are very surprising. I can tell you that. Really? Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> but I, I should not say more because... No, no, no. We don't want to land you in yeah. shit, dude. <laughs> If, if Dave Grohl's listening to this, can you imagine how many other people are? <laughs> um, obviously, Danny's going to be defending his title. I think Danny's going to be up there. But it's one of those, man. It's wide open. There's so many people coming into the year healthy. Like, pretty much everybody, as far as I'm aware. Um, everyone's healthy. It's, it's wide open. Um, it's probably, what, 10, 15 guys who could win the first round, give or take. Um, yeah, yeah. It should be fun, man. It should be fun. Um, you know, the one main question for me for the last three years was, is, is Greg Minar still still up there? Yeah. And, uh, you know, during the last couple of years, every year somebody said, well, it's over. He should quit. He won his last race last year. He was never going to win again. And then next weekend he wins. So he's like, so it's so crazy how he can keep winning. Mm. And so, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see if he just does it again this year. Yeah, I think yeah. obviously Greg's got other guys behind him. Not, not other guys, but like new guys. So maybe a little bit of a point to prove on the syndicate with Luca and um, and Loris. Um, needs to maybe establish himself as the man on that team. I don't know. It's uh, It's going to be interesting, I think. Um, yeah yeah there's so many people it's i don't know it's pretty hard there's so many things so many questions it's just like yeah let's just wait and see what happens i guess and then the conversations are probably better after the first round because we sort of know where people are at but who knows i think it's, <laughs> it's gonna be fun hopefully brendan wins for you <laughs> 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 all right man i don't want to keep you too much longer so uh let's crack on with these uh listener questions if that's okay these listener questions are once again supported by Saks Underwear. As you know, Saks is the best underwear on the market. So throw out all that Primark rubbish that you've got in your closet right now. Grab some Saks from your local bike shop or search them online. Prices start from just £19 and every pair of Saks Underwear comes with the patented ballpark pouch. And it does what it says on the tin. It keeps your nuts in a nice little pouch, stops them from swinging because we all have that problem and it prevents any chafing when you're cycling or walking, running, whatever you choose to do. Um, don't just take my word for it. If you search National Geographic and Saks on Google, you'll see that they uh, labeled them the best underwear on the planet. They're used by people like Ken Block, Danny Hart. Uh, for more information, you can head to saksunderwear.com or like I said, ask for them in your local bike shop. All right. All right, buddy. Okay, so. The first one we got in uh, was from uh, Instagram, a dude called at Chris the Abyss. 
God, people have the strangest names sometimes. I read that as Chris the Absis earlier. I was like, that's disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Chris wanted to know, how do you feel about the apparent dumbing down of tracks? And is there any way you would add to the UCI calendar? Um, what does dumbing down mean? So dumbing down, I guess, means um, maybe more bike park orientated tracks, just a little bit tamer and not as rocky and rutty and gnarly. Yeah, that is just a useless topic because that's just not the case. No. It's uh, we're going in the opposite direction, and even even the even tracks like Leo Gang, where people always moan about it's a bike park, they have changed so much in the last couple of years in the right direction. Um, it, it's the the World Cup tracks are awesome. And we don't need to go in in a direction of of Red Bull Hardline, even though that is absolutely awesome. It's it's crazy and cool and super exciting. Yeah, it's also but, super dangerous as well, though, for the guys every weekend. Yeah, and you know, a World Cup race should still be about who is the fastest down the hill and not who is surviving. Mm. And you, you can do a Red Bull Hardline once a year, and, and that, that, that's super good and super cool. But then at some of those huge jumps, it, it's not really, you cannot make a difference. You cannot, you know, you cannot go faster or slower on, on, on those road gaps. They're just, they, they're at a given speed. Yeah. While uh, on a World Cup track, it gets harder with the speed you ride it. And so, um Makes that's sense. what racing is about it's not it's not racing is not on who who jumps the biggest road gap it's who is the fastest it's, it's as simple as that yeah and riding uh, right even if it's a simple course if you want to ride it on the limit it's going to be hard but there is no simple courses in the mountain bike world cup it's just they are they are good as they are yeah and i think it often looks different on tv too like tv is not really a great representation as to how gnarly the tracks are from going to a few rounds myself and you know you look at something on tv then you actually look at it in person and think jesus christ like it's so different to what we what we actually see at home um and obviously the speed's hard to kind of gauge as well when you just sat watching it on tv um but yeah i agree with you man totally agree great answer loves it um the next one was from Instagram as well, which is at Enrig7. And uh, this is a bit of a tough one, man. I'm sorry about this one. <laughs> um, how do you, <laughs> Sorry, in advance, I'm sorry about this. Uh, how do you deal with the backlash from comments made by you or Warner while in the booth? Obviously, there's a few examples of like maybe the Rat Boy stuff and Rachel Atherton. Uh, well, first of all, for Rachel Atherton... Yes, that makes me think because I am really trying to do my job well and I've, uh, I've talked to her before that and after that and even a year before she's told me that she's not quite happy with what I'm saying about her. So I asked her, hey, can you please explain because I, I need to know what I can do better. And uh, but she, uh, there was no example she could give me, so I went back to Red Bull and asked them, "Hey, did I ever say anything negative about Rachel? Because if that's the case, I really must know, and I really want to improve yeah. on being better." But then Red Bull told me, "No, they they don't remember anything of me says being negative about Rachel." So that thing there really, yes, it did take some energy it, um, because obviously I don't, I, there's no reason why I would say no. something negative about No, you're not there to upset Rachel. people. <laughs> no. But obviously, you know, like uh, we're talking for two hours and maybe if somebody gets a word in the wrong mood, then it could, it could piss somebody off. And so uh, I apologize if that was the case. Yeah. Um, it was certainly no intent. And then with Josh, I don't know. I, what was the deal? I, I, I announced that he retires from racing, but that was what he told me before the race. And um, he was talking about it so openly that I had no impression whatsoever 
that this was a secret right. or if right. as we talked about it genuinely um it seemed that it was no secret at all um so there was no reason for me to hold that information back but uh uh, have you heard anything about that afterwards? Because I haven't. No, not all. I think, no, I, I, again, it's just people um, jumping on the Twitter thing maybe and just being like, what the hell? He said this and things can easily get blown out of like context as well. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, yeah. It probably wasn't a secret at all. I mean, anyone who's close to Josh would probably know and word spreads and stuff like that. But I don't know, man. I, I, like you just said, at the end of the day, you're gonna you're talking for two hours. Things are gonna come out. It just is what it is. You know, it's, yeah. it's, the sport's not about political correctness or anything like that, is it? You know, you just say what you say and that's it. <laughs> you know, um, so I don't I don't really have an opinion on it. If I'm honest, I just think it is what it is. Um, but yeah, I don't think it's it's. I don't know. I don't think it helps when people can easily just jump on like yeah, like social media and just blow things out of context. Um, yeah, I think that's a, a huge negative, but huh, I don't know, man. It is what it is. At the end of the day, um, <laughs> breaking news. Who cares? <laughs> um, the next one from uh, at one as sixty nine dude, which again, strange Instagram name, man. It looks to me like one as sixty nine dude, which no, I don't. Uh, <laughs> how do you manage to actually speak and be funny when barreling down a World Cup track? Smiley face emoji. Uh, probably comes from growing up in Zurich and Zurich are known as big mouths. So uh, I'm living now up in the mountains and every time you mention you're from Zurich, they're all like uh, rolling their eyes and like, yeah, big mouth. <laughs> right, really? <laughs> <laughs> it's funny though, man. Keep it up. I think it's hilarious. Um, that's pretty much it, man, for listening to questions. I think the only last thing I have for you is what we've started doing is that the previous guest and asks a question so in this case it was kathy sessler so she had a question for you um and then if it's okay i want you to set the question for the next guest um, all right all right so kathy's question was what passion fueled you in your career and what keeps driving you forward solid question from kathy sessler well what was the first part of it what passion fueled you in your career in my racing career it was purely the the riding itself the yeah. fun the feeling like you know speed airtime whatever feeling you get on the bike obviously i was ambitious as well and wanted to win but what keeps you on the bike is is the feeling you have when you're going 60k through a rock garden or over a jump yeah sweet and the second part of it was what keeps what driving me the, you forward. Well, that's I think we explained that at the beginning yeah. of, of the whole podcast. It's really seeing what we can achieve, seeing that we are maybe, maybe, possibly, hopefully changing the world a little bit. Mm. And uh, that will make me work even harder in the future. Awesome. Brilliant. Okay, so if it's all right, I want to get a, get a question from yourself for the next guest. It can be anything. Uh, so without knowing who the next guest is? Yes. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, that's a hard one then. It is. It could be anybody. Kathy didn't know it was going to be you either, to be fair. She had no clue. Ah, Okay. What? Uh, <laughs> it's pretty hard to think of one. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> it's quite similar. It's actually quite similar to the one of Kathy. But yeah, what's the reason why you are in the mountain bike scene? Yeah. And what keeps you in it? Excellent. In the mountain bike scene, and what keeps you in it? Cool question, dude. Perfect. Yeah. All right. All right. I'll make sure that gets asked to the next person. Um, All right. I want to say a big thank you, man. Really good to have you on here. Awesome to hear like some insights from you. Um, obviously, all the best for the season too with everything, Velo Solutions, with the team, like everything else you're doing, which is a load of stuff. Um, and yeah, do you want to just as well, just really quickly shout out any social media links you have for the companies or the race team or anything like that? 
Yeah, well, if I do the whole list of our sponsors and friends <laughs> and we don't ever, have time. it will be endless. <laughs> but uh, yes, it would be cool if you visit us on Scott Vela Solutions, either on the on the website or on Facebook. And yeah, you'll get all the info there. Sweet. Perfect, dude. All right. Well, uh, you go enjoy your evening. It's been a blast. Thank you again. And uh, no doubt we'll, uh, we'll catch up at one of the rounds this year. Yeah, my kids are hungry. I need to cook for them. <laughs> yeah, I'm hungry too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. You take care. It's been a, it's been a, it's been a pleasure. Okay. Thank you very much. See you, buddy. Take it easy. You too. Bye. Bye. Boom. Thank you ever so much, everyone, for checking out episode 25, our anniversary. It's a happy anniversary to us. And uh, thank you again, everyone, for listening in and checking out these episodes. It really, really is appreciated. Um, thank you at the MTB Shed, too, uh, for the share on social media. M. Lawman as well, for the positive vibes. At Vos Joseph, for your positive comments on Instagram. At Rusty Crankles, for always checking out the episodes and leaving us a, uh, some feedback. And also Gilly242, hang on, Gilly220, I can't speak, Gilly2040 as well on iTunes for your amazing comment the other day. It's, uh, it really made my day. Um, don't forget, sign up to our mail shop as well. Um, just head to uh, Facebook or in our, uh, in our Instagram profile. Um, you'll be able to see how to sign up to the mail shop. If you sign up, you get some, uh, you, get, you get mails off us and you get some promotions from our sponsors and all that sort of stuff. Keep an eye out for our uh, anniversary edit coming out soon. And thanks a bunch, everyone. Thank you for checking this episode out. It's been a blast. Have a great week. And uh, we'll speak to you after the first round of the World Cup from Lords with a downhill insider. It's going to be a killer episode. We're going to recap the weekend. Uh, that'll come out next Tuesday. Boom. Peace out. <laughs>